Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Crystal Beauclair, and I'm the Marketing Associate at Forth, and I'll be handing over moderating duties to my colleague, Stephen Alleman, in a second. Um, I want to remind everyone to please be sure to submit your questions through the attendee chat uh, and try to specify who your question is for. We have three amazing speakers, uh, and we'll introduce them very shortly. Uh, to give a bit about Forth, uh, if you're if you're here in this evening uh, webinar, you likely know about us, but I'll I'll just tell you a bit. So Forth is a nonprofit trade association advocating for smart transportation. We work in four focus areas: industry development, demonstration projects, advocacy, and consumer engagement. We are advancing smart transportation. Want more information about Forth? You can visit us at forthmobility.org. So today um, we'll we'll be joined by three speakers and moderator, uh, Stephen. Stephen, I'll ask that you turn on your camera, please. So Stephen manages the EV Ambassador Program and organizes ride and drive events in Oregon, Washington, and California. Prior to Forth, Stephen worked for Multnomah County on urban forest management and community outreach. Stephen holds a uh, BS in environmental sciences from the University of Oregon. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Stephen. Thank you for the introduction, Crystal. Um, well, first off, I'd like to just say a big thank you for all for you, to you all for joining us this evening for a webinar. Um, we've got a lot of wonderful uh, electric vehicle owners um, that are here to share their experience with you all. Um, just want a reminder, as it says on the screen, please make sure to submit any questions you have. Uh, don't worry if there's any questions that you like, kind of think are silly. Just throw them out there anyway. Um, I also want to say that I hope you're all doing well during these times, um, you know, with the wildfires and COVID. Um, so I hope you're all staying as safe as you possibly can. All right. Just a second here. Um, so we're actually going to uh, actually, Courtney, are you in a place where you're able to talk right now? We, we had a slight hang up where uh, Courtney is actually uh, surprisingly in Denver um when she was supposed to be there yesterday so i'm not sure what happened but the flight got bumped up or something um so courtney if you're able to unmute yourself uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh you to everyone um this is our first ev owner and speaker um courtney mcray alston um all right uh well i'm i'll introduce courtney while she's uh getting unmuted uh so courtney drives her chevy uh bolt ev and she actually uses her, her electric vehicle for a working vehicle. Um, she drives for Lyft, Instacart, and Amazon, um, and specifically picked the Bolt because it has a lot of good features for, um, or good qualities that, that really make it work well for a working vehicle. All right. Um, well, we may jump back to Courtney, actually, once she gets her audio working. So. Let's go ahead and um, fast forward to Allison. We will jump back to Courtney once her audio is working. All right, um, this is Allison Ready Able. Thank you for turning on your webcam, Allison. Um, Allison her, and her dog Meadow uh, went on a cross country road trip uh, in her Tesla Model 3 during the heat wave of 2019. Um, that's for a lot of, if for folks that don't know, uh, you know, road trips and EVs are a little bit more challenging than your average vehicle because you have to stop and actually charge it. And heat can have various effects on um, the battery. So um, without further ado, uh, go ahead and take it away, Allison. Allison, I think you are still on mute. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. I am. Um... Uh, was interested in getting an EV for several years before I actually did. And I uh, live in a condominium building with a basement parking garage. And so I joined the buildings, um, had an EV charging committee starting to try to see if EV charging would be possible. And I was on that for over a year and then started looking at cars and met at the order show, the people from the Oregon Electric Vehicle Association uh, so I started going to their meetings and went for nearly a year and actually met Stephen there because some of the meetings were joint meetings with Ford. And I just wanted to learn more and hear, you know, hear more about electric cars. And finally, I made my decision in November of 2018 uh, to get the Tesla Model 3. Uh, and since then, I've driven 16 
8,000 miles in it. My usual driving is around 8,000 miles a year, so not much, anywhere from 10 to 30 miles a day. Um, I'd wanted a long range vehicle because I didn't have electric, have electric charging in my home spot. So I usually use public charging, which isn't, isn't what's recommended, but uh, that's what I've been doing. Um, and I did, we have taken a number of long trips. I've actually done more driving in this car than I tended to before because I enjoy it. Um, but we, we went to Archer's National Park in Utah and back. And we, I also did a cross country trip from Portland all the way to the coast of Massachusetts. And as Stephen said, that was during a heat wave. So that was interesting and, and back. Um, and I've also driven down to Fresno, California and back. And just there, there's so many surprises of good things that I, I had no clue about getting a car, such as uh, dog mode, where I can leave the air conditioning on for my dog while I go shopping or, or you know, whatever. Um, it's just been such an advantage and really changed how I plan my, my trips and my day, just even my day with groceries and stuff. Oh, I can just leave the dog in the car. I don't have to take her home or find a shady spot or whatever. That's been a real nice surprise. Thanks. Looking forward to your question. All right. So if anyone has questions um, about the road trip or dogma in general, um, or just about the Tesla Model 3, uh, make sure to address them to Allison in the attendee chat. Um, just a fun anecdote that I want to throw in there is uh, I didn't know dog mode existed until I met Allison and I thought it was super cool. It's got a little hand that waves on the screen and just tells everyone, don't worry about the dog. Like the AC is running. Please don't smash the window. Um, I just think it's a really cool feature altogether. So it looks like uh, Courtney is back online. So we're going to jump back to her slides really quite quick. Courtney, uh, are you able to speak and would you like to do your um, introduction? Yes, can you guys hear me okay? Um, you're a little quiet. Is there any way to try to get a little closer to the mic? Yeah, is, is this any better? Perfect. <laughs> All right, so uh, hi everybody, I'm Courtney McRae Alston. I do apologize, I was not supposed to be leaving for Denver until tomorrow and we had an emergency, I had to come today, so I'm not where I should be. But I'm still super excited to talk about my Bolt and about owning an EV in general. Um, when I started looking at buying an EV, it was because I use my car for work. So I drive rideshare and I also make deliveries for Amazon and Instacart. So typically I'm driving three to 400 miles a day. So that was a lot of usage of my car. And um, I started looking for a more economically feasible way to get around. And I, I'm not sure how I figured out that I should buy an EV. I, I know how I figured it out. I'm not sure what first got me thinking about an EV. And it's funny because I forgot that I went to Forth before I bought an EV and got all kinds of information and talked to people there. And then I convinced my poor, you know, grown adult child to buy a Ford Focus EV, which was a complete disaster, not because it's not a good car, <laughs> but, but because she's in an old home that um, could not charge her car. So she would plug it in at night and nine hours later, it would only have like 10, you know, miles on it. And, but it taught me a lot that that experience with that car, which she kept for one week before giving it back to the dealership taught me a lot and, and, and actually helped me to make the decision about buying my Bolt. So I have to say that the information that I got from Forth, as well as a bunch of, of research that I did on my own, helped me to find my Bolt. And I love it. It's an amazing car. And, um, you know, I hope that other people start to look at EVs because they're just, they're awesome. Awesome. Um, thank you for that shout out, Courtney. I really appreciate it. Um, so we are going to jump forward a little bit to Bob. All right. Um, nice to see you, Bob. So Bob and I actually met um, 
because the Lake Oswego Sustainability Network uh, has a yearly ride and drive event um, that they put on. And unfortunately this year, um, we will not be doing that uh, together because Forth likes to work with them um, due to COVID-19. But they are actually having a webinar of their own and I can provide more information uh, later in the presentation. Um, but yeah, take it away, Bob. Well, um, I wanted to start by just explaining a little bit of uh, what a plug-in hybrid is. That's my car there, the Outlander, um, Mitsubishi Outlander. Uh, when I tell people about this car, they don't always understand what I mean by a plug-in hybrid. Um, a conventional hybrid uh, is sort of the prototype of the um, of the Prius, uh, which is, goes back to 1997. And in that case, the uh, the gas engine is supplemented by an electric motor powered by battery, and the whole idea is to improve gas mileage. Um, the car captures energy by recharging the battery when the car is going downhill or coasting to a stop, and that adds a considerable efficiency to the whole system. A plug-in hybrid can do that just as well, but it can also run on straight electricity because the somewhat larger battery can be charged by a cable from an ordinary outlet, or if you want to, from a level two charger. The electric motor, in this case two motors, uh, can then power the car on battery alone for the first 20 miles or so, and that really helps, uh, uh, it gets help from the gas engine as needed, but uh, when the battery runs low, the gas engine takes over. So that means that for short trips, you're primarily uh, a full electric vehicle, no gas. And in fact, most uh, driving trips are short. Um, if I could get to the next slide here, uh, I will uh, illustrate that. Uh, this graph shows the, uh, the, 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 the length of a one-way trip and, and the frequency of that. And, and so, as you can see, most uh, trips are under 10 miles and a lot of trips are under 20 miles. So uh, this car can go 20 miles uh, without using any gasoline, and that means a, a great reduction in carbon emissions. Um, in fact, uh, when you average everything up, this car is rated as getting 74 miles to the gallon. It can do even better depending on how you drive. So, for example, uh, my wife and I, um, uh, since COVID, uh, I haven't driven all that much, and uh, we went from uh, February to August without adding any gas at all to the to the tank because all of our trips were short. So, uh, so the uh, the idea of a, a plug-in hybrid is that it's great um, for for short trips, which are mostly electric. But when you need to go down to the coast or uh, go for a further um, distance, uh, you've got that gas engine, and you don't have to worry about what's uh, called range anxiety, which is sort of a problem sometimes for people who drive a full electric car. Uh, and um, also you can, uh, because you can just plug this car into an ordinary uh, 110 outlet, you don't have to worry about getting a, a special charger for it and it might be handy for people who live in an older home or in an apartment place where uh, we're getting a, a special charger is a problem. Um, so anyway, we wanted to get a car. We had previously owned Priuses, and then we bought a RAV4 hybrid, but uh, that really didn't give us very much extra um, mileage. And uh, so when we found out about the Outlander, um, it was a bigger car, so that we could take our two dogs, and uh, we uh, had a lot of space in the back to uh, haul things around. And uh, and so uh, we love this car, and uh, and uh, um, it's the price is also something to talk about. Uh, th these cars start at about thirty six thousand dollars, but when you add the uh, federal tax deduction of fifty eight hundred dollars and the Oregon rebate, that takes the total of over eight thousand dollars off the price. So you're down into the twenties. Uh, for really uh, a car that's very comparable to the, the famous RAV4, but it has a lot of uh, nice features. One of the features that I uh, get kind of a kick out of is this ability to plug in the car uh, 
for your microwave if you want to put it in the back of your uh, camping trip. Or more seriously, if you lose power during a windstorm, you could plug in your uh, freezer and keep your your uh, your uh, freezer uh, goods frozen until the power comes back on. We haven't had a chance to use that really, but it's just kind of a, a unique feature of this car that I thought was kind of fun. So that's me. Awesome, thank you, Bob. Um, and if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that uh, plug actually goes off of the lithium ion battery. I think that was written next to it. Um, so and, and you can recharge the battery by just running the motor uh, to keep the battery charged. So as long as you have a tank of gas, you, you have essentially a, a, a generator in your uh, garage if you ever need it. Right. Yeah, it could be could be a good use for um, if you were dealing with some resiliency or you know, in the time of when we had these fires, if you couldn't get access to normal electricity, that would really help you out. Yeah. Um, all right. So we actually have our first question here. Um, and feel free to turn on your webcam if you can. Um, and so it's, it, I believe this is directed at Allison or maybe Courtney, but it's from Tom um, Nielsen. And uh, how, so how do you drive 400 miles a day? Um, don't you need to stop and charge? Um, I, I'm actually. Not I think sure. that is that's for me. Okay. <laughs> I think that one is for me. Yeah. So that's a that is an awesome question, and so the Chevy Bolt. Uh, the reason why it's such an amazing car is because it was really the first car that was both priced in a manner that people could afford it, but also with a nice range. So the Chevy Bolt is has a range of, I believe mine as a 2017, I don't know if it's changed in the last couple of years, but the range is listed as 238. And that is the range that you would typically get from the vehicle if you're driving it in different situations. Um, so I typically drive my vehicle on the city streets. I don't drive it on the highway much. I drive fairly slowly. And, I, um, and I'm an experienced driver. I've had my car for a couple of years now. And so I tend to get about 300 miles per charge out of my vehicle. I do have to stop and charge my vehicle if I'm going 400 miles. Um, but in a, in a regular workday, I'm not driving 400 miles at one time. So I'm doing deliveries. I'm doing you know, ride share. So there are time frames where I have downtime. And when that happens, I charge my vehicle at a fast charging station. So if my vehicle were at empty, if it were zero, if it had, if I like basically pushed my car up to the charging station, I could have it at 80% in an hour. And if, if I just needed like 20%, I could have that in like 15 minutes. So, yes, I do have to charge my car at some point during the day in order to get to 400 miles. That's a great question. Thanks, Courtney. Um, and just kind of another question for the panel here is, um, so, Bob, you mentioned that you charge using just a regular 110 outlet in your home. Um, I'm kind of curious on, you know, how you charge typically, Allison, and, and same with you, Courtney. I don't know, you know, if you charge at home or if you rely on public chargers. Um, anyway, uh, take it away. Oh, Allison, you're on mute again. Oh, I, I was. Uh actually going to ask you if Courtney wanted to talk about how she charges at home first. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I do a combination of home charging and public charging. And so like Bob, I also plug my car in on the level one charger, basically the plug that came with my car. I plug my car in just the way you would plug in your cell phone or your Fitbit or your microwave or anything. Um, I do tend to plug it into uh, a heavier duty uh, like outlet. So typically the outlet in my kitchen or 
the outlet in my laundry room because those outlets are typically they're, they're typically they've been upgraded to make sure they can handle as much current as possible. So I do charge my car at home when I am at home. Um, when I am out, I charge at public chargers. And typically I use the PGE chargers because they have such a really great subsidized program for EV users in the Portland area. So for $25 a month, I get unlimited fast charging at any of the PGE chargers in, you know, it goes all the way down to Salem and you can get chargers out in Hillsborough, Beaverton or on the east side, like 82nd Street, Milwaukee. Well, it's not really on the east side, but it is, but Milwaukee, Wilsonville. So there are a bunch of chargers, public chargers everywhere. And I do also use other public chargers, typically EVgo and Blink um, are the ones that I would use if I'm you know, either out at the shore, if I'm away from the, you know, PGE area or like if I'm up in Seattle or something. So that's typically how I charge. And for me, I, uh, I don't have any sort of electrical access in, in the garage in my condo building. Um, so I would be happy to have just a standard plug, 120, 110, 120 plug, you know, uh, just like uh, the Bob and Courtney's cars, uh, the Tesla comes with a plug that you can just plug into a standard outlet. It only gives, uh, it only charges about three miles for every hour that you're plugged in. But for me, a 10 hour overnight would provide 30 miles, which is really great. And then uh, I'd be able to do any additional charging in a public charger. But as it is now, I mostly go to level two chargers that are somewhat in my neighborhood nearby on errands that I have to do, et cetera. Or I go to one of the um, Tesla superchargers uh, to fill up all the way. So I try to make a balance of, um, of how I'm charging. And, and real quick, just to clarify on that, um, how long does it take to, you know, on average to charge at a, a Tesla supercharger? Um, I went to one this morning and I was at 29% and it took 25 minutes to get up to 80%. But that was at a 250 kilowatt, a very, very fast one. And on the little computer screen, it was saying 700 miles per hour of charging. But wow. those are the, there are differing levels. The one in Tigard is only 75 kilowatts. The one in uh, along I-5 in Vancouver is 150 kilowatts. The one by Vancouver Mall is 250 kilowatts. Gotcha. But you only charge up to 80%. So, you know, you're, something a lot of people do with electric vehicles is, you know, base, you're charging off of your needs. It's also better for the battery, is what is my understanding. Is, you know, if I were headed out on a long trip, I would charge uh, probably up to 90% and then find a way to charge any more if I could on a level two. I'm just sort of, uh, trying to make sure my battery health is good. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's something people, uh, you know, are pretty cautious about. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, uh, you know, I know that a member of your group, the OEVA, the Oregon Electric Vehicle Association, um, Chris Homequest has actually fast charged his Nissan Leaf a ridiculous amount of times. Um, and we use this little te piece of technology called Leaf Spy on it. Um, to figure out how much the battery had degraded over the 200,000 miles he'd put on the vehicle. Um, and I think it was below 20% degradation, um, which is a lot less than people expected. Um, and not only to mention um, that the Leafs battery is, is typically not as good at protecting itself as something like the Model 3, which is a little bit more, um, it's a little newer and the battery technology is a little bit better than um, some of the older Leafs, which is what Chris was driving. All right. And I just, I do want to point out with charging that typically, unless you're driving the way Chris and I drive, which we, we both use our vehicles commercially. So we both, we both fully charge our vehicles every single day. And I've had zero battery degradation, but my vehicle only has 90,000 miles on it. And I've had no battery degradation and I've charged it every single day, fully charged at a fast charger every day. But most people don't do that because from zero to 80 percent is really fast. It is fast. It's typically 
you know, getting from 30% to 80% is a half an hour. And that's, you know, for my vehicle as well. Um, but from 80% to 100% takes another hour and 15 minutes. Most people do not want to sit around for an hour and 15 minutes for 20% of their charge. So that, that's why you'll see people like me and Chris fast charging and, and charging fully every single day. But most people do not need to do that. That's a very good point. Um, all right. Uh, jumping back to the questions from uh, the audience. So we have a question from uh, Yvonne Alman Granados, and her question is for Allison. Um, so when you went to the East Coast, approximately how many times do you think you stopped to charge? Okay, um, I stopped every couple hours because I'm older than I used to be, and I get all stiff and creaky if I um, sit longer than that. Uh, and that was actually the main reason for stopping when I did, not that the car was out of battery. Um, there, you know, the um, the Tesla superchargers are interspersed along all, ma all major highways, most major highways. And I was bypassing at least one or two uh, before charging. Um, so I'd say I charged, and and also sometimes you just stop just because you want to, and um, uh, I charge. You know, charges don't have to be that long. You don't have to fill up to that eighty percent. You just need enough to get to the next charger. Um, I'm tend to be somebody who charges every time I stop. Um, but I, I could look. Uh, I had printed out my. Three, four, five. So I've uh, just on a day. I just checked some records I had. I just charged five times in uh, one day of driving, six hundred twenty-three miles. Gotcha. So you were kind of stopping along the way just to kind of get your brakes in and just get the battery up. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I used to when when I was younger and drove a gasoline engine. I'd drive until the tank was empty. You know, and then fill up, and then drive until the tank was empty again. But, but um, I actually, I just can't do that anymore. <laughs> Understandable. I always like the break uh, at you know. Sometimes there'll be there'll be a charger at a scenic place, and I like to just kind of get out and walk, or I don't know, play hacky sack, something, something fun. Um, all right. So we have another question. Um, and sorry if I mess your name up here, Betsy. Uh, but from Betsy Woski or Wosko, sorry. Um, and let's see if I'm answering, if I'm asking this question correctly here. Um, why does a battery degrade if left at a certain percentage? I'm not sure I totally understand that. Um, I think the, or go ahead, Allison, looks like you were going to say something. I was just going to say that, um, uh, as you try to fill a battery that's already fairly full, it can get rather hot and it's just harder to get the electricity in. So going from like 90% to 100% just takes a lot longer because it's sort of harder for the little electrons to find the, uh, you know, to find their place because almost all of the spaces are full. So it's a longer, slower, hotter process. And so it's just, both, uh, I've just heard that it's, uh, you know, keeping the batteries between 20 to 80% if you know for most of your use is just better for for the batteries yeah and i think we have to remember that if you, all of us i i think probably everyone on this call has a cell phone and if you think about how your cell phone charges your cell phone over time the battery degrades and if you have a cell phone that you plug in all the time you'll notice that it gets warm or it gets hot and that heat can damage the battery. So that's that's one of the reasons why we don't charge our vehicles when it's hot. When it's if it's above 75 degrees, I do not fast charge my vehicle. I will put it on a level 1 or a level 2 charger. I will not fast charge it in order to avoid more heat um, on the battery and the potential for the battery to be damaged. So I, I think you know, you're going to see, you see degradation in batteries that's in pretty much any battery. So your cell phone battery, you know, the battery, whatever batteries you have, they do degrade. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I would say though that um, part of the reason the batteries slow down so much going from 80 to 100 percent uh, when you're charging that way um, is also just to help protect the battery. Like they don't want to like really, it, it probably could charge much faster. Um, but like Allison said, it really has to regulate the heat a lot more um, and find space for those electrons to go to charge up the battery to 100%. Um, that's why it's recommended to stick between 20 and 80%. However, they also you know, say that if you, you can charge up to 100%, if you're then going to just drive down uh, away, you can drive it down to less than 20%. And you know, if you're headed on a long trip, that's fine to do. Absolutely. Um, all right, we got another. Oh, go ahead, Courtney. Oh, I didn't know there was. I saw a question really, really early on about picking your one favorite something, and I didn't know if it had gotten lost in the shuffle. I was actually about to ask that. Uh, so that's to everyone. Um, kind of, you know, what is your one favorite thing about your specific EV? Um, and yeah, just let us know. Courtney, would you like to start us off? Oh my God, one favorite thing. That's really tough because there are so many things I love about my EV. That's a really hard question, but I'm going to try to say just one thing and not lose my mind. Um, <laughs> the, the fact that these cars are so um, incredibly such a great financial decision for someone who is not, if you're not driving long distance, like I, you can drive, like I drive to the shore, I drive to Eugene, I drive to Seattle. That's not really long distance. I don't typically drive to the East coast like Allison did, um, which you, you can do it with these cars as well. But I think for me, the fact that I went from spending, you know, 300, almost $400 a week, uh, on a internal combustion engine vehicle um, with, between gas, oil changes, tune-ups, you know, different, I mean, I can't remember the number of moving parts that a combustion engine vehicle has, but it's like hundreds and an electric vehicle has like 20 moving parts. So there's literally nothing to break down. The only thing I've done for my vehicle is buy tires for it. Um, and so if you can imagine saving Four hundred dollars a week for years—it's it, incredible. And I mean, at the same time, I'm doing something that's good for the planet. <laughs> I'm sorry, I added a second thing. Ignore that. It's it's the savings, <laughs> but and all the other awesome stuff. Well, I think uh, I get the biggest kick out of uh, trying to keep the uh, my trips short and uh, and patting myself on the back for not burning any gas. Uh, I got this car in part because I was, I've been worried about global warming and wanting to do my little part. Obviously, it's not a huge contribution, but it's something. And uh, it's kind of fun, actually, to, to see how long you can go without having put any gas in the car. And uh, even though it's a full-size car, my dogs love to ride in it. Uh, and uh, we can go to the nursery and buy plants for our garden and you know haul things around because it's got that size and space but uh, and yet it's for the most part uh, a real ev yes and for me this is gonna uh, sound silly perhaps but it's so quiet it's so quiet inside and and i just love that it's just really nice um, and then the other thing that thrilled me was just, I, I felt so, when I did make it to all the way to Massachusetts, I felt so grateful to live in a time where somebody like me, an ordinary person, not particularly overly adventurous, can, can go all the way across the country in an electric car. I, I just felt like that's great. That's wonderful. So those two things. <laughs> I think everyone had two things. It's, that's a good sign, though. That's really awesome. Um, all right, so we have one more uh, question here. Um, let me see. So what is the optimal level for batteries? 80% um, to 60%? Um, you know, this kind of varies, uh, and I'll, I'll let the panel um, discuss it as well. But I think 
technically the answer would probably be 80%. And that would be what is the optimal, optimal battery percentage to charge up to. Um, you know, I would take that with a grain of salt though, because if you're charging at home and using a 110 outlet, like all these folks are, you can absolutely let your car charge up to 100%. That's not going to be bad for the car. It's We're mainly talking about um, fast charging when we're talking about keeping between that 80 to 20%. That's just because there's so much more energy rushing to the battery. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about performance for a little bit. Um, you know, all of, it sounds like all of you have previously owned um, a internal combustion vehicle and all have the ability to drive in 100% electric mode. Bob, it sounds like you actually make a game out of it, which I think is awesome. Um, I know Courtney does too with trying to drive as efficiently as possible. Um, and I'm sure you do as well, Allison. If you want a road trip, you got to um, kind of monitor that stuff. Um, what have been some of the surprises uh, of switching to an EV uh, when you drove? I mean, yeah, when you, you made that switch from gas to electric. I think for me, the regenerative braking or, or the regenerative recharging, because um, I just sort of, that wasn't a, I had heard about it, listened about it. Um, but um, in experiencing it, you know, to be actually retrieving miles as you go downhill is really cool. You know, um, uh, it, it's not as much, you know, obviously you use a lot of energy going up the hill and you're not going to recoup all that going down the hill. But, you know, when you're in a gasoline engine, you may see your, your mile, miles per gallon go up a lot, but you're still idling an engine, even if you're just rolling down the hill. Whereas in the EV, you're actually earning back some battery percentage and miles as you roll down that hill. And it's really cool, you know? So. The uh, regenerative braking on, on my car, you can kind of, with these little paddles on either side of the steering wheel, you can either turn it on or off a little bit. But So you turn it on when you're going down the hill and you turn it off when you're, uh, uh, when you're going up the hill. But I think the, the, uh, also you don't have to use your brake as much uh, because cause if you have the regenerative brake, regenerative uh, switch on, and you let your foot off the gas pedal, it will slow down without any braking. And so you preserve your brakes. I, I don't know what in the long run that'll mean, but I assume that it'll be a long time before I need to have any brakes repaired or fixed, you know? Yeah, I 100% agree. I love the regenerative braking and it does. I mean, my car is always in regenerative braking. I keep it in that mode constantly. And I do make a game of when I start deliveries, I'll say, let me see if I can come back from my delivery. Because deliveries are always to typically residential places, which means I'm on city streets. And I try to start out and come back with the same number of miles by using my regenerative braking, which is always a lot of fun. <laughs> but I think for me, the thing that I found most surprising was how really well designed my car was some of the, there are so many really cool features that I had not even considered. And I've, you know, and I've owned, I've owned some really great cars. Um, and to have a car that, you know, has heated seats in the back, which I, you know, all my customers, my rideshare customers love having their seats heated in the winter. Um, and I think the, you know, just things like, because I have something that even, you know, even my friends who drive Teslas are like, wow, you have a 360 degree camera. It means that there's a camera and it looks like I have a view from above my car. It makes it so easy to parallel park. It makes it so easy to like, just see what's around me. And, and I'm always getting out of tight spaces because I'm delivering to people's homes. And so, you know, you never know what the driveway situation is going to be or the street situation. And um, just all these little really thoughtful features that make the car fun to drive. But I think the thing for me, and, and probably for Allison as well, and I'm not sure about Bob with the Mitsubishi, but you know these cars do not have any gears. So they are all torque, they are all power. And when you put your foot on that gas and you accelerate, uh, Tesla has the fastest car in the world. 
my little Chevy Bolt can like kick butt on most sports cars out there. I can go zero to 60 in five seconds if I want to. And that's shocking. It's literally shocking yes. <laughs> in a fun way. Yes, I, I, I didn't really care about that zero to 60 thing at all. Um, and uh, having owned the car a couple of days, I, I took my husband and son out for a ride in it to see what it was like. And I pulled onto Columbia Boulevard and then realized the car coming behind me was going faster than I thought. So I stepped on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was nauseating, to be honest, how I, I will never do that again. And since then, I put my car in chill mode because I don't want that. And it it um, it, it really accelerated so fast. And, and uh, you know, now I also have a better sense feel for how much to press the accelerator. But um, uh, it's also nice to be able to pick up when I need to on the highway and everything, if I need to sort of scoop past somebody or something. But um, I'm generally a pretty sedate, very overly careful driver, so I did put it on chill mode. But it is, it is the the electric cars. There's no there's no delay to get the gas to the motor. It's just pure. The you you press on that accelerator, the electricity is right there at the motor, making it go. So it's a very fast response. Some people may wonder about a, a plug-in hybrid is if the if it's running in electricity and then has to switch over to gas, is that a smooth process or do you sort of, well, it is very smooth. It's seamless basically with, with the outlander anyway. So you really don't have to worry about uh, whether you're on electricity or gas or some combination of the two. It just, it's very smooth either way. Yeah, you just don't quite that get that um, as much instant torque when you you switch over to the gas motor oh, that's true and you get you can kind of hear the engine kick on um i bet yeah. it but it's, but it's I, I heard a little bit before i got the car as to whether they you know it would sort of have to stop electricity and start gas and you would have some kind of a transition where it was sort of awkward but it's not like that yeah very good point um yeah and you can even put the car i think in in hybrid mode if you know you're going on a long trip um, just to make it more efficient um, fuel-wise, which is a pretty cool feature for that vehicle as well. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the regenerative braking. Uh, you all mentioned it as something you really like. Uh, a cool thing about that is it does really um, cut down on the wear on your brake pads. Uh, people who drive EVs uh, have said that they replace their brake pads about a third as often as someone who drives an internal combustion vehicle. And that's all attributed to the regenerative braking, which both plug-in hybrids and um, regular complete pure electrics have as well, uh, which is just an amazing feature. Um, but I do, I, I do hear you, Allison, on the you know stepping on the accelerator and feeling a little nauseated. Um, you know, I take people on test drives for the majority of my job, and um, I've, I've been in a couple. Uh, a couple rides where people really go for it. All right, um, we have another question. Do for that reason. Yeah, chill mode is a, chill mode's pretty smart. I know that that's what they do with all uh, Teslas that are on on rentals. Um, they make it so they have to stay in, in um, chill mode. And on the flip side, Teslas also have some Teslas come with a ludicrous mode, which we don't really even need to get into, but it's it's faster than anyone needs to go. Um, all right, we got a, another question from Betsy Woski, or Wo Wosko. Sorry, Betsy. Um, what maintenance, if any, is required? So I can say for my Chevy Bolt, um, the only maintenance that I have had is replacement of my tires, I have taken it in twice to be looked at at the dealership. Um, both times it was free. Um, one time was in the winter when my battery was not fully charging and it was because it was cold. And so um, batteries, the batteries can be less efficient in the cold. And so, and also I was, I was using, I switched from using PGE's charger downtown, which fully charges your battery to 100%. 
to one of the newer chargers, which only would charge your battery to 99%. And so I wasn't used to not getting 100% and I thought something was wrong. So I took it in, they looked at it and they were like, nope, it's absolutely fine. And then um, I took it in again because I was coming close to my warranty ending period um, because most EVs, uh, at least they used to, I don't know if they still do, but most EVs have a hundred thousand mile warranty on their battery. Um, which is why when people say to me, oh, but won't, uh, what happens if, the, if something happens to the battery? Like uh, I've heard things and I don't know, most combustion engine vehicles do not have a 100,000 mile warranty and most EVs do not suddenly conk out after 100,000 miles. So I wanted to get it in before I hit that 100,000 miles. I took it in, they looked at it. It was beautiful. It was perfect. So the only maintenance I've had is, you know, my just changing tires. That's it for me. I just want to make a comment on that. I think people probably know that the dealers make a lot of money from servicing cars. And one of the reasons that they are not too eager to advertise electric vehicles, even though they may have them in their showroom, uh, or uh, is that they, they know that if they sell an electric vehicle, they're not going to see that car very much once it goes out the, out the door. And uh, so uh, I think that, that's not emphasized enough probably with, uh, with EVs. Yeah. And for me, I'm, I, my adjustment difficulty is in trying to remember that I'm supposed to rotate the tires because I, with an ice engine, I used to associate that with oil changes or something like that. And I have nothing, no maintenance schedule to remember that maybe I need to get my tires rotated to keep them in good condition condition so um and the the list uh, of what the maintenance things were at first to me seemed sort of silly it was like change your wiper blades rotate your tires you know such basic stuff that I, I, it, it seemed um very surprising when i looked at it yeah and yeah. i think what yeah i think it's really um I just want to point out that when I purchased my car, the dealership gave me a um, suggested uh, maintenance schedule. And that suggested maintenance schedule was exactly the same as for a combustion engine vehicle. They're like, bring your car in every 3,000 miles and then every seven, then every 10,000 miles. And, I, and I'd done a lot of research before I bought the car. So I was like, are they crazy? Why would I do that? <laughs> and then they wanted to charge me what they would have charged me to bring in a combustion engine vehicle. It was really ridiculous. I simply ignored it. And I just said, yeah, I'm not taking my car back to the dealership. And I did not take my car back to the dealership for like a year. Um, and then when I did take it back, it was free anyway. That's awesome. Um, I just want to throw in there that uh, I help maintain um, Forth's Force fleet of EVs that we use for ride and drives. Uh, and so, you know, we have about five to seven cars, or we had about five to seven cars last year that we, we saw. Um, and the maintenance was just absolutely nothing you know it's exactly what you all said like i would add um windshield wiper fluid and maybe take them through the car wash and that would be pretty much it i think we only had to rotate um the tires on a couple just because we had less mileage than um uh, some of you probably have but it was extremely easy i was i was very happy to see how um easy it was maintained not just one but you know five cars at once and just to just to be clear, that's for EVs. And I know I did a lot of research on hybrids as well, but hybrids statistically have more problems than EVs or combustion engine vehicles because, and that's just statistically, that doesn't mean, I mean, Bob's car could have had like zero problems, but statistically you have two systems at work and you have the interfaces between the two systems, there are just more things that can go wrong. It's like when you get a really high end car that's electronic, everything, there's just more that can go wrong. And so with an EV, there's just so little that can go wrong with a combustion engine vehicle. There's a lot that can go wrong with a hybrid. There are two systems and something, and there's an interface. I don't disagree with that. And uh, I think that's a, um, you know, a liability that uh, is, is there potentially, and we'll just have to see how it goes so far. 
I, I guess my uh, thought was that because I do so much of my driving uh, electrically, that that gas engine is not getting as much wear as it as it would if I were an all electric car. I mean, an all gas car. We'll see how that all uh, bears out, but I think that's quite correct. Awesome. Um, well, I'm just going to call out to the audience that we have about 10 minutes left. So if you have a question that you really want to ask, make sure to type it in. Um, and beyond that, I just want to talk about kind of the car buying experience real fast. Um, was it any, I mean, we talked about the dealerships, we talked about maintenance, how they kind of give you the whole um, roundabout where they want you to come in every couple months. Um, what was it like buying your EV and was it any different than buying an internal combustion vehicle? Um, and Allison, I'll, I'll pick on you first because you went through Tesla, so that's a little bit different of a, of a process. I, I did go look at other EV cars uh, in in dealerships that mostly dealt with, with gasoline engines and it was surprising how little the, the people I took to could answer questions or, or knew about it. Um, I, you know, they'd always have a person uh, to talk to and I'd have to go back another time when that person was going to be there who could talk specifically to me. Um, but, um, but the, the Tesla experience was felt very streamlined and easy, you know, just, uh, talk to people, got to try out a car, got to look at some, uh, and then it just, it was just very easy. And I, I felt very comfortable with it because I'm not somebody who's comfortable negotiating prices. So I learned that it's just, this is the price. That's it. You either buy these additional features or you don't, or you don't buy the car. But, you know, it's I, I like that. I like the straightforwardness of, it, of that experience. Um, so that, for me, was very comfortable. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, Bob or Courtney, do you, how, was, how was your experience? Courtney, go ahead. So for me, I was also surprised, like Allison, that when I would go to dealerships to look at vehicles, the salespeople would not know anything about the vehicles. And I had done a ton of research on these vehicles, so I knew a lot about the vehicles. And, and I remember when we went and bought my daughter's Ford Focus, um, you know, we were taught the salesman knew absolutely nothing about this car. And because he knew nothing about the car, he said he just said all kinds of crazy stuff, which is the reason we were able to take it back later. Because <laughs> it was like, yeah, he said this and this and that. And those things just weren't true. And so that was really shocking. Um, but I think that in terms of the experience of buying the car, um, I think it was a little different from a combustion engine vehicle because you had, uh, I think, a lot fewer options in terms of, you know, what kind of car you're going to buy, what the features are. I mean, for my Bolt, there are only three, I think there are three model levels. There might only be two. Um, but you don't have a lot of choices. You know, it's not like you're comparing, you know, six different cars here. You Once you start looking at, once you start trying to figure out what kind of car you want, um, the field narrows pretty quickly. So I think that was something that was very different for me. And of course, I bought my car used. And so buying my car used, there were there were a surprisingly large number of Chevy Bolts that were available used. Um, and so there, but I think that uh, when I when I first tried to buy a car, I tried to buy the Kia Nero, the brand new EV Kia Nero. It wasn't even available in Oregon or Washington. I would have had to have flown down to California to get it. And um, there, there were like, there were no options. It was like, this is what we have. If you want it, you take it. If you don't want it, oh, well, you know, so that really surprised me that there were not a lot of options. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I want to ask you that, I guess for the Tesla thing, you order it, you know, and I ordered mine at a time just before the end of the federal amount so there were a ton of cars we needed at the time i was told i'd have a month's wait um uh, it was less than that and um you know when i got the car it had been manufactured like three days before that 
um, and then delivered up here. So um, it's another difference with the, uh, you know, that, that, that you, you may be looking at cars, but you, I think they have some that you can buy off the lot, but mostly you just order yours made. My uh, transaction was not uh, altogether wonderful. There was uh, <laughs> some difficulty with a salesman who, uh, there seemed to be only one salesman who knew anything about the, the hybrid car. Uh, I must say though that they, the dealer was pretty motivated and gave me a, what I think was a quite a good trade-in for a car that I, the RAV4 that I, that, and I really wanted, I, I didn't want another um, uh, cream-colored car like my other one was, so uh, I insisted on the brown one and they had to go up to, uh, I think they finally found one up in Walla Walla or something like that and they, they had it driven down to Portland so uh, I could get the color that I desired. So there, you know, it was there were some good things about it, um, uh, but I think that there, uh, the fact that this car w was very popular in Canada and very popular in, in England, I, I had some feeling that I was uh, getting a car that had been sort of road tested and wasn't uh, a completely new uh, idea, even though it was just introduced to the U.S. Uh, the year that I bought it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, it's, I mean, I'm glad you had at least some, what of a good experience where they want to get you the exact color you're looking for. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, I, I would say the, the takeaway I heard from that is, you know, make sure to do some research on your own. Um, and if you need any help with that, uh, you can reach out to us at fourth. Um, my email will be at the end of the uh, presentation. So we got our last question in here. Um, do you all feel that there are enough public chargers um, for you all or, you know, when, when you're going around, um, maybe you have different experiences from state to state. Um, and also they're curious on what phone apps you use to find those chargers. I use PlugShare and Chargeway apps as, as well as Tesla, the computer on the, in the car shows where uh, Tesla chargers are um and uh, destination chargers um i i feel that there is more competition for the chargers but um i know that down in california it's it's even busier um than here so uh, of course i'd love to see loads of chargers everywhere you know they talk about these chargers that pop up out of the sidewalk where you park your car to plug in. That would be lovely, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, uh, so I'd love to see more chargers. Yeah, I think that we are very fortunate in Oregon and Washington to have a lot of chargers everywhere. I, you know, I definitely use public chargers every day and we're very lucky to have so many, but I have been in areas where charging is not as strong. Um, so for instance, you know, when I was in Alaska, which makes sense because Alaska is cold. And so an electric car might not be optimal there because batteries don't do as well in the cold. But when I've been in Alaska, I found that, you know, charging is not as prevalent. Um, and even for my relatives on the East Coast in some areas, uh, the charging there aren't as many chargers, but here I think we're lucky. I think we have a lot of chargers um, and that we, I, I think we have a lot and there, there are plenty and it's very, and I think as long as you're not charging on a PGE charger, that you're gonna be able to get on a charger really fast or a Tesla charge, but the, the regular like Blink and EVgo uh, in this area, Portland, Washington, well, Portland area, um, people don't get on them as much because most, EV owners who drive a lot have PGE's subsidized program. So it's true. Um, all right. Well, we are actually at seven. So I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, big, huge thank you to all of our presenters um, or all of our, our panel. Um, thank you all for being here. I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's great to hear your stories of how you switched to going electric. 
Um, if anyone has ques uh, questions that they didn't get answered or questions to think of later, um, feel free to take a picture of my email. And if you have questions for anyone on the panel, I will forward those on um, to those folks and make sure you guys get in contact. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you all. I just want to give a little bit of an outro. I wanted to thank you all for joining us today uh, for our evening webinar. I hope you were able to eat some um, nice food while you watched. Uh, and a big, big thank you to our speakers and moderator. You all were amazing. Uh, feel free to email with any additional questions. Uh, and finally, I wanted to also mention that you should feel free to join us for a national drive, well, excuse me, national national drive electric week events, such as our event in, uh, with Clean Technica on September 30th uh, on electric pickup trucks. More can be found at our website at fourthmobility.org slash events. Thank you again for joining. Uh, and I hope that you can come to our upcoming webinars. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. Night.